Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Great, excellent. Um, I was first time I've been to Luna Park, uh, walked in this morning, and I thought, what is an unusual venue to hold an event like this? Until I saw the banner that's across the entrance. Did anybody see it? Anybody notice it? Here it is. I photographed it on my way in this morning. <clears throat> and it says, hell on the harbour, unsettling, blood-curdling, and scarier than ever. So welcome to this year's Cuskill Conference. A <laughs> um, few things I want to talk about. Um, hopefully persuade you to listen to me for the next sort of 20 minutes or so, though it'll feel like an awful lot longer. Um, and just a few thoughts that have occurred to me, that have inspired me, that have made me challenge my thinking over the past few years I want to share with you. Um, and then finally, a little competition and as a prize. And the prize is this. It's my book. Now, uh, the reason I mention this is, is twofold. One is um, it's a damn good read, obviously. Um, but two, it's published by Wiley. Um, they reckon worldwide its sales will be about 3,000 copies. And, and I get $3 a copy. So this is pretty life-changing. Um, <clears throat> so what I would like you all to do, obviously, is to buy a copy. Or if you don't want to spend the $30 on the copy, just give me $5 and don't buy a copy of the book. I'm happy, um, I'm happy either way. But it, it comes from some of the work I've done over the last 30 years and some research which I'm going to share with you over the course of the uh, next 20 minutes or so. Um, our host kindly introduced me, gave you a bit of background. I, I won't talk too much about that, um, other than to how pleased I am to be here in Australia chairing 86400. Not a bank that I started. It was the idea of some far brighter people than me, but I'm really pleased to be here uh, and to help Rob and the team deliver this a different banking experience, smarter banking into the Australian market. But the key reason for this slide is really the picture and I want to just explain this to you. Um, some of you might recognize the guy on your right. Um, it's a guy called Will I Am. And Will I Am, many of you will know, he's an um, eight times Grammy Award winner, most downloaded song ever until very recently, first uh, songwriter to have a song broadcast from a satellite going around Mars, which begs the question why, but that's a different question uh, entirely. Um, what you might not know about him is he's very, very passionate about the future of technology and has his own very interesting technology business. He employs about 250 people, um, some in LA where he's based, in Israel, in Singapore, um, and elsewhere, primarily around voice-activated AI. <clears throat> and when I was looking to, uh, we were building out Atom Bank, I thought, if, if, it's the old marketing game. Some of you marketers might be familiar with this. You go, if, if our brand were a person, who would it be? What are the anthropomorphic qualities we'd look for in that person? So you want you know, young, as a millennial audience. You want tech savvy, living in social media. And he kind of came to mind. So did a bit of research. Uh, I Googled him. And it came up that he has this fascinating in insight into, into technology, a regular speaker at, at Davos. So to cut a long story short, I put him on the board of Atom as an advisor. And as part of that, we needed to do some promotion about it. So we arranged a, a photo shoot in, in LA in his offices. So I fly out to LA and um, I had previously visited Iran um, so the Trump administration decided I was not a fit and proper person to enter America. So I was held in secondary. Anybody have been in secondary? Yeah, not very nice, is it? No. Um, especially when I hadn't done anything wrong, I hasten to say. And I was held there for five hours. So Will did the only decent thing, which was instead of staying at the photo shoot, he went home. So they actually shot this in two parts. They shot him first. And then five hours later, 
they shot me. So we are not together in that photo. Now I know that, but I would swear I was in that photo and I'm not. Well, not in the one of, of the two of us. And really it's a metaphor for everything I want to talk to you about for the, the rest of my presentation, which is don't believe anything I show you and only believe about half of what I tell you. So when starting a business, and, and I've started a, a few over the years, or when involved in a business, a new business, or looking at a new product or a new service or a new experience for customers, first question I ask myself is, what is the customer problem that you're solving? Because I look out there and I see lots and lots of solutions to problems that nobody has. There are an awful lot of apps out there solving problems which just nobody has. And I, I believe that the purpose of business is to offer customers a better product or a better service or a better experience. And if you manage your business well, you will be profitable. And the profit should be a, a byproduct of doing that. I think part of the problem with financial services in general and banking in particular is that most banks have lost sight of the customer with a few honorable exceptions. I know a number of them are represented here in the room. But in particular, the big banks have lost sight of the customer and the real problem that the customers are facing. So the problem can be further, I think, subdivided into a few different parts. So there is the what is the customer problem? So are we solving a real and prescient problem that customers have? But then the, there is the kind of market problem, which is there may be a problem that customers have, but are they prepared to pay for that solution? Because there's an awful lot of solutions out there that people like, but are simply not prepared to pay for. And then the question becomes, is the market segment for your solution big enough? Is it big enough for you actually, actually to make money out of? Because, yeah, I'm not against profit. I do think it is important. You, know, you need to ensure that the business has funding to sustain its long-term growth. The people who work in the business need to be properly rewarded. The shareholders who put up the risk capital need to be, have an adequate return on the risk that they've taken for putting up that capital. But not every product is of, or service or experience is of sufficient interest to consumers that they are willing to pay enough money for it. Which then leads on to the problem about the industry. Is the industry one that has longevity? It's great to find a customer solution to a problem, but if it's a small segment that is in de terminal decay, that's not very helpful. You know, you look at, there are so many examples of of industries like, like uh, cameras, compact cameras, that have just disappeared. There were some great solutions in that marketplace, but the market simply disappeared. It was overtaken by, by something else. Oh yeah, I mentioned I was in, um, in Iran. This was a photo at a conference at, at which I spoke, and it, it went down generally pretty well, with the exception of one one person who didn't find it quite as amusing as everybody else. In fact, he's, he's an imam. He's actually a, a really, really lovely man and has a, a, an interest in business and came to the conference. Um, and I took my son to Iran because it was just a great opportunity to, uh, to be there. And the, the imam came to the green room uh, post, uh, in between speaking events and came up and said hello and introduced himself to, to my son. And he said to my son, how do you like Tehran? And Felix said, it's beautiful. People are absolutely lovely. Um, and the women here are beautiful. And the Imam said to him, how old are you? And Felix said, 26. He said, are you married? He went, no. He said, at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning, I will turn up at your hotel with two brides. And for the next 24 hours, Felix was crapping himself. <laughs> um, fortunately, he didn't. He did have a great sense of humor. 
But that wasn't, that wasn't the purpose of this slide, just mentioned it en passant. Um, it's to talk about something called The Innovator's Dilemma. Has anybody read Clayton Christian's book, The Innovator's Dilemma? A couple of people. It was written in 1997. Uh, Clayton Christian is the Harvard Business School Professor of Administration. And the subtitle to the book, The In Innovator's Dilemma, was Why Technology Causes Large Businesses to Fail. And it, it's, a, it's an academic book, but I would, highly readable, and I would recommend it to you. And he talked about two forms of uh, innovation. There is incremental innovation, which is small step change. I think the Japanese would call it kaizen, gradual improvement. There is disruptive innovation when something comes along and changes a category. Um, yeah, Uber would spring to mind as, as an obvious example. What his research told him was that these new innovative companies tend to have smaller market sh markets and work on lower margins. And as a big business, as a mature business, as I'm sure many of you here in the room are, you go, well, why would I want to reduce my own margins? Why would I want to take a smaller segment when I can have a, a bigger segment? But all of his research and all of the data which underpin his research says that those smaller companies on tighter margins tend to grow into bigger companies. And the bigger companies can't respond because their operating cost base is too high. And by the time they've recognized what these new smaller companies are doing, it is too late for them to change their business models. And his solution was that if you are a big business, you basically have to disrupt yourself. But you have to accept that that will mean a smaller margin in the business that you're creating. And of course, the great opportunity in banking in general and financial services, sorry, Fallacies in general and banking in particular, is to use technology to drive down the cost of the delivery of the experience to the customers. They're able to deliver a better experience to customers digitally at a much lower cost. And that is the real opportunity for the new entrants into the market. And I think the dilemma facing the bigger existing players who have these very high fixed cost infrastructures. Anybody follow the Edelman Trust Barometer? Anybody follow it? A few of you. So for the last 19 years, Edelman, which is a global PR and research company, have been looking into consumer characteristics, particularly around trust. And what they've found is that over that period of time, the trust in the four estates, uh, in, in religion, in government, in people, and in the mainstream media, are a continual state of decline. Uh, when I grew up, you trusted your doctor. You know, the doctor was a, a pillar of society, unless he was Harold Shipman who murdered 300 of his patients. But leaving him aside, most doctors are highly trusted by, by, their, um, by their patients. Do you trust your doctors? Yeah. Uh, last year, 2018, yeah, 2018, was the first year in which Edelman have seen a decrease in trust in doctors. Uh, it was uh, by a piece of research by a doctor called Eric, ironically, a, doc, a doctor called Eric Chung, who discovered that the trust in doctors is declining. Not surprisingly, you don't need me to tell you about the state of trust in the, uh, in the big banks, big financial services providers. But even there, there's this weird dilemma because you ask consumer groups, you ask journalists, do your readers trust the big banks? And they go, no, they don't. You ask the big banks and say, yes, they do. We have all of this research which shows how our customers trust us. And you go, how can this be? Who's wrong? And the answer is they're both right because research tells us 
and I can refer to an excellent book which, which covers this very well, $3 to me or $5 if you don't want the book, which says there are two types of trust. There is what's called cognitive trust, which is about competence, and there is associative trust, which is about intention. So we deal with the first one, cognitive trust, about competence. Do you trust your big bank to be competent? Well, the answer is generally yes, you do. You know, if your salary goes in on the last day of the month, you assume your salary is going to be there on the first day of the next month. If your mortgage payment goes out on the third Thursday of the month, you expect they'll pay your, your mortgage. If you go to an ATM, put your card in, you expect to be able to draw out $200. So people trust their big banks to be competent. That is cognitive trust. Associative trust is about intention. And put simply, it is this. Do I trust you, my big bank, to have my best interests at heart? And the answer is generally, no, I bloody don't. I trust you to take advantage of me at every opportunity that you can. And I think the big trust challenge for financial services as a, as a whole is not around competency, it's around intent. It's about proving to our customers that we genuinely care about them and we put them first. And to give a, a, a little example, and forgive it being um, an advertisement for, for 86400, but we say that you look at behavior around savings, and a lot of the banks make their money by promising a headline rate, but then ensuring that most people don't actually get that. So we said, well, we'll give you prompts to remind you, if you need to put in $1,000 a month to earn the headline rate, and you've only put in $700 so far this month, we'll send you a prompt saying, you need to put in another $300 to get your, uh, your savings bonus. Now, of course, that costs us money, but we think in terms of associative trust, in terms of proving our intent to customers, that is a very important thing to do. And it's worth the offset of cost or, or, or of income against that. What, one of the things, uh, it was mentioned earlier, that I've raised quite a lot of capital over the years, um, which I should just mention didn't go to me. It actually went into the institutions. Um, and one of the challenges, well, how can you take on, in the UK when we launched Metro Bank back in 2010, people say, well, how can you take on the high street banks? How can you start a one branch bank, which uh, Metro Bank was? How can you start a bank on digital devices with no physical um, manifestation of, of your brand? How can you do these things? How can you take on the big guys? And I think within that was an implicit assumption that big means better, that there are economies of scale. And yet all of the evidence, I think, tells us, all the data tell us, that there are diseconomies of scale. It is very difficult in big businesses to change culture. Um, and we've seen many, many attempts to do this. It's very, very difficult for big businesses to be agile. And we've seen uh, many examples around the world of big businesses who've recognized that they're using legacy technology, but have singly failed to transfer to new, more modern technology. Not because the technology didn't exist or the technology was better or usable or provable or scalable, but because of the issues around um, data transformation. Most of the large scale projects fa failed because of uh, data transformation. So big banks, uh, big financial services companies tend to struggle culturally. They struggle with agility and they struggle with growth. If you are making $5 million uh, a year, doubling that to $10 million a year is not necessarily a Herculean effort. If you are making $15 billion a year, scaling that growth becomes, becomes very, very difficult. And the final point tends to be around the operating jaws. In modern digitally delivered businesses, you have a very low fixed cost base. 
uh, and higher operating margins as you scale your business. So the jaws tend to be bigger in newer digital businesses. They tend to be much, much smaller in, in, uh, in existing, more mature businesses. So I think the conclusion for that for me is big isn't necessarily better. I think there is a real opportunity for smaller businesses to take market share and to grow, going back to the previous point about the innovator's dilemma, to take small markets that then become much bigger markets. Um, quick prediction, I was asked to give a prediction, uh, long hair's coming back. It may be too late for some of you, but my prediction is that long hair's coming back. Um, and I was also asked to give it a quick takeaway, and then it, I want to leave you with a final thought, if I may. So th some of you will be familiar with this quote from the American 19th century philosopher, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who said, and it's paraphrased, but is generally taken to be, if you build a better mousetrap, the world will beat a path to your door. So the, the inference being that if you innovate, if you create something that's demonstrably better than what exists, the market will accept you. And I think the takeaway for me is that that, that just isn't true. That building the better solution is only half of the, half of the challenge. Uh, indeed, there are some great solutions out there, some t technologically innovative and better solutions that simply did not succeed. So half of it is building the better mousetrap. The other half of it is creating mass adoption. Because we, we've seen examples of you know, Betamax versus VHS. It's probably just thought lost on most of you. Uh, videos, VHS video versus Betamax. Uh, Betamax was a superior technology, but the VHS adoption was so much faster that became the, uh, the de facto standard. So I think for people who are looking to create new businesses, for people who are looking to innovate and develop within their businesses, creating a better mousetrap is important but creating the adoption of that is equally important. And most of the businesses I've seen that have not done this, this is largely because they have not allowed a sufficiently large marketing budget to help create that adoption. All of the, the, their uh, funding has gone into the idea and not enough of it into the delivery of it to the market. So this brings me, you will be very pleased to hear, no doubt, to my last slide, which is my competition. So does anybody know who this is? And the prize, remember, is this fantastic book. Did I mention this book? Yeah, I did. Uh, anybody know who it is? Anybody like to guess what he does? Have a guess. Sorry? A banker. Anybody else like to have a guess? Mountaineer, Mountaineer thank you. He, uh, his name is Eric Wenemeyer. Um, Eric Wenemeyer is a mountaineer. Apparently, this photo is taken on the top of Everest. I'm not so convinced because I think that mountain behind looks higher. But we do know that Eric Wenemeyer climbed Mount Everest. And you go, so what? So what, he's climbed Everest. Uh, I think the youngest person to climb Everest is 14, and the oldest is a Japanese gentleman at the age of 76. So he's sort of more or less in the middle. What makes Eric Wenemeyer quite unique is that he is blind. Uh, he was sighted until he was seven years old. So he knows what it is to have sight, but he, he had a debilitating uh, disease and he lost his sight. And he was determined that he would not allow that to be an impediment to his life and that he would use that opportunity of disability, he saw the disability as an opportunity, to show other people that you can do anything that you want to in life. And I had the, uh, the pleasure and the misfortune, both at the same time, 
of speaking after him at a conference. And the, the pleasure was he's absolutely a brilliant speaker. If you ever have the opportunity to, to hear him, uh, I would highly recommend you, you take it. The, the misfortune was he's an absolutely brilliant speaker. And having to speak after him, yeah, I'm pretty shit to start with. I look terrible by comparison, uh, by comparison with him. But he said something in his presentation, which I'd like to leave with you, because it struck me viscerally. It literally struck me viscerally in this presentation. And you've all heard the expression, seeing is believing. Yeah? All heard the expression, seeing is believing? Yeah? He said, that's wrong. He said, what the expression should be is believing is seeing. Believing is seeing. Because if you believe in what you are doing, you will see the outcome. You will go through good days, you will go through bad days. You'll go through good weeks, you'll go through bad weeks. You'll go through good months, bad months. In some instances, you'll go through good years, you'll go through bad years. But Eric Wenemeyer's advice, and I would recommend it to you, is that if you believe in what you are doing, you will see the outcome of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.